In this series, we'll talk about race cars, sports cars, and convertibles. Um, as part of uh, our continuing series in the study of uh, ground vehicle aerodynamics. Well, race cars, um, and uh, we have here a race car, a race car, a Formula race car, and uh, a convertible. Race cars, uh, for race cars, it's the aerodynamic forces that uh, are the main factors which affect the control of the race cars. Remember that uh, as the speed increases, the influence of aerodynamic contribution becomes very significant over uh, just the tires or the, uh, or the, the uh, brake force. The dominant force is the aerodynamic force. And as expected, race cars and, and um, expected convertibles, because most convertibles are small cars and tend to be race cars. They, the two are not necessarily coincident, but it just happens that most sports cars are usually race cars. So the same goes for race cars. Uh, they, they usually go at high speed, so aerodynamic forces become the main factors that affect the control of, uh, of such cars. Brake handling, driver control, inertial forces, movement of the center of pressure relative to the center of gravity, those are some of the factors which affect the, the, the cornering, uh, the turning, the stability of, uh, of uh, uh, race cars. It's the same thing that applies to motorcycles. I will mention that when we come to motorcycles, but they, they are very significant in the performance of uh, race cars. Uh, convertibles, yeah, they're typically drag embracers by design. You know, they're, they're cloth, uh, for the cloth for the cloth covered cars uh, for convertibles. These are all things that bring uh, uh, additional drag to a vehicle, uh, and, and this is known. Uh, the the luxury enjoyed by the the introduction of these devices. In one case, the absence of the top. In the other, the introduction of uh, the, the the cloth cover, uh, which which is common with uh, convertibles, they they are luxuries which is paid for in uh, in additional drag to the vehicle. Uh, a sports car is typically small. It's low weight. It's typically two doors, and it's a two-seater car designed for high performance much beyond that of a sedan, uh, and approaches that of a race car. So uh, a, a sports car is, is uh, something in between a race car and a sedan. It's not a hybrid in the sense of hybrid because it doesn't incorporate the entirety of both, but uh, it's got a bit of a race car in it and it's got a bit of a sedan in it. Sports cars combine high performance, which is a design feature of race cars, with uh, passenger comfort. Uh, at least to some degree, uh, passenger, passenger comfort is a primary uh, design feature of uh, a sedan. Now, sports cars, they're often used interchangeably, sometimes even without modifications as race cars and, uh, and everyday utility. So sports cars have that uh, uh, middle of the road uh, uh, classification. Most important aerodynamic goal in race car or sports car design is the maximization of downforce. Remember the downforce, because stability is very important in its performance, especially the turning and the speed. Most of the performance of concern is, is in the turning and the maneuvering, and, and downforce is very important for the stability of the vehicle. We know that at high speeds, uh, race cars or any car generally, uh, has this relationship, the downforce is proportional to the square of the vehicle speed. So uh, the, the higher the downforce for that which is able to generate downforce at high speed, the uh, downforce increases continuously. Uh, to to uh, the, the second power of the, of the speed. 
high downforce increases the normal force on the tires, which is desirable, highly desirable for stability again, and this in turn increases the car's braking performance. Uh, the significance of downforce is underlined uh, when we consider this little example uh, for uh, a race car that, uh, for a race car that's going at a speed of about uh, 250 kilometers per hour, uh, the downforce uh, of the lift coefficient is minus two. So it's, it's significant. We have a, a CL, C sub L, of uh, minus two when, when a race car is going at about 250 kilometers per hour. And uh, the braking distance uh, that uh, is uh, saved, that is the reduction in braking distance because of this uh, increase in downfall, downfall, it's about 30 meters. So it means that the car is able to stop 30 meters ahead of where it would have stopped without this extra downforce that is, uh, that is uh, uh, given to it uh, because of uh, the improvement in, uh, in the car's uh, uh, downforce contribution. So uh, again, if for a downforce of zero, uh, we would, it would, the car would stop at 120 meters and when the downforce, the C sub L uh, is, in, is reduced, that is increased negatively to a minus two, uh, the vehicle is able to stop at, uh, at uh, 90 meters. So a saving of 30 meters, which is 25% reduction in the braking distance. And that, it's, it's something like that, that is uh, a determinant of the vehicle performance because those are, uh, those are indications of uh, the effectiveness of the of the car as a, a good performance vehicle. The turning speed is enhanced by the downforce. The higher the downforce that a race car can generate, the greater is the speed at which it can safely negotiate a turn. What does that mean? Well, as the car goes, it can afford to go at very high speed and turn without expecting to flip uh, at that very high speed. And the, the higher the speed at which a vehicle is able to turn and, you know, without entirely slowing down, the greater is the performance of that vehicle rated at. So these are, these are benefits of uh, the downfalls. They're usually experienced uh, a lot in the tires. Now, the underbody of a race car is generally shipped with some channels in it. Uh, this, is, this is the vehicle, uh, the underbody, this vehicle is uh, going this way. Uh, and uh, the air, of course, is, is coming the opposite way. So the airflow is going that way. That's the airflow under the vehicle, the underbody airflow. Now, this is uh, shaped like ch uh, channel. So this is white here with uh, some, uh, some inward curve in here so that the flow here is diverted inward into this channel and it goes out from this channel. So the flow becomes diverted and, and packed into, into a path uh, so that the speed at which it comes out is, uh, is higher. Uh, if, if the flow is packed in here, it goes at a higher speed out here than it would have here, which is a, a, a desirable thing. So uh, the, the the shaping of channels and dams, as it's shown uh, in, this, in this picture, they help to streamline the flow and to increase the underbody effectiveness area. Because uh, when, when channels and dams are added, there's a greater surface area over which uh, the, the, uh, the air can flow. And this re results in increased downforce and improved engine cooling also. Now, external, externally mounted uh, inverted aeronautical wings, they are common uh, in, uh, in, in race cars and sports cars. Uh, they are negative lift devices. Uh, they are generally incorporated in today's designs, as we've said. This is an example of such. This, uh, this is uh, an externally mounted uh, uh, 
where uh, uh, inverted aerodynamic winds, uh, and we will talk about those uh, as, as we look at uh, examples as we go along. Uh, the intended function, of course, is to in increase the downforce, and the vehicle wheels are pressed more to the ground due to the higher pressure on top of these mounted wings. There's a higher pressure here than is coming from under it. Therefore, that higher pressure pushes down uh, on the wheels, and therefore the wheels are able to, to uh, grip the ground better, and that is increasing stability and that translates to better performance of the vehicle. So these are desirable things in, uh, in uh, race car and sports cars uh, designs and the, the, the traction improves and so does the cornering characteristic of the vehicle. Um, we have different mounts. We looked earlier on at uh, a mount. This is a side view of, uh, this is a side view of uh, what, what we looked at in the last uh, presentation, in the, in the last slide. Uh, the front deck uh, mounts primarily to help streamline uh, the starting flow. So we have the front deck, which is here, like the, if, if we go back, if we go back here, that's, a, that's the front deck, okay? The front deck of the vehicle, uh, of the, of the uh, mounting device, and this is the rear deck here of the mounting device. So, uh, we'll come back here. So, uh, the front deck mounts primarily, uh, they help to streamline the starting flow. And the rear deck mounts, they reduce the lift. That is, they increase the negative lift. When they reduce the lift, that aerodynamic lift, they reduce the lift on the rear wheels, which means they increase the downforce on the rear wheel. So these serve, as you can see here, to increase the downforce on the rear wheel. Uh, and uh, all right, we got that one. <laughs> so the yeah the the rear mount increases the downforce on the rear wheel, and uh, the front mount uh, essentially streamlines the flow increase the aerodynamics and reduce the drag. So the front mounts are drag reduction, the rear mounts are stability increases. Uh, the positioning of the rear deck mounts uh, does matter a lot. This is the rear deck mount here. And it's very important how it's positioned. We don't want it to be too far because uh, if it's too far, this is what will happen. If it's too far behind, that is, if uh, if it's too far behind, if this were to be, say, here, what would happen is it would, it would increase the downforce all right, but then it would add a turning effect so that the vehicle would tend to nose up, which is the, 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 the reverse, actually, of what is desirable, and the vehicle would therefore not be stable. So we don't want it to way, way behind. It's got to be in such a position that it doesn't create a turning effect, which causes a nose up of the car. So that's one of the things to keep in mind in positioning uh, these uh, aspects. So that, and and uh, you, we don't want it too low either because, uh, see for example, if it's here rather than here, it would be in, this, in, the, in the stream of the flow coming from the rear of the vehicle main body. So the rear of the vehicle main body would add drag to it, and so there will be increased drag and probably turbulence in the flow. So you don't want it to be in the, in the free stream uh, of the flow coming from the rear of the vehicle. So it should not be too far behind, and it should not be too low. So that's, that's uh, one of the things to keep in place. These are intricate designs. And those little details will need to be uh, kept in mind uh, as uh, these features are being designed into the race car. Now, uh, most race cars have end plates. These big end plates here. This is an end plate. Uh, this end plate. This is an end plate. Okay. Uh, the the primary purpose of the end plate is to reduce the downwash. Without the end plate, without this end plate, the flow 
will just uh, go and would split from the end because it would just be uh, it would become a two-dimensional flow uh, instead of dominantly two-dimensional that would be desired and that would be the case with the end plate. So with the end plate there, the end plate stream uh, kind of forces the flow so that the flow does not shed, doesn't shed at the edges here, but it just goes straight there and streamlines the flow. Uh, and, and that reduces the downwash. You, know, you don't have this downwash, you don't have this downwash. So it's almost eliminates the downwash. That is the desire, that is the intention of uh, the end place. It turns out also that it has uh, an unplanned benefit in the sense that uh, the aspect ratio is improved because now there's a higher surface area due to the end place. The surface area of this, of this end place adds to the surface area of, uh, uh, of the uh, rear mount. So you have a rear mount assembly that has a higher surface area, which improves the aspect ratio of, uh, of the vehicle, which is beneficial for, again, for increased uh, downforce. Um, now let's, let's look at uh, uh, different forms of, uh, of uh, convertibles. Uh, let's look at this, for example. Uh, let's look at the aerodynamic phenomenon that's taken place. This is the free stream air coming this way, as we've seen. So it goes here. Uh, if if the, the, this uh, windshield is uh, the the more perpendicular the windshield is to this uh, profile the greater the drag that's generated. We looked at that in the, in the design of uh, the different parts and sections of the vehicle, and we looked at the benefits, and we saw that we want this to be as much as possible in this direction. That is, we want the planting windshield uh, to improve the aerodynamic performance and reduce the flow separation, and reduce the flow separation and expedite the flow reattachment. So, uh, in this case, we will presume that uh, the optimum inclination of the, uh, of the windshield has been established. But still, uh, this, this convertible, this, this is a phenomenon that takes place. This flow comes and then hits uh, the top here. It doesn't have the typical feature that you have on cars where the flow can go over. So it doesn't have that. So uh, we could say, well, that's good because then it doesn't have the drag that would be generated by the top of the vehicle. However, because of the design of the, of the uh, windshield and of the side uh, glasses of race cars, there's nothing restraining it here. There's open air here. So the air flows and comes in here and flows and comes in here into the passenger compartment. The flow from here does not have a restraining uh, boundary, which the glass provides, and it goes into the flow. So there's a lot of turbulent air flow in. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, when, when the vehicle is topless like this, people typically strap themselves very well in the car. If they have some gown that's flowing. You see the gown flowing all over in the car, and they start to try to, to force it down and push it down. There's a lot of turbulence generated. There's no restraint of flow in there because it's not a controlled environment. It's open to the elements outside. And as the car is open to the elements, so are the occupants open to the elements also. So uh, the benefit that would have been gained, the aerodynamic benefit that would have been gained by the absence of the top in the sense of uh, not having the drag that uh, accompanies the top of the vehicle, it is lost, and probably uh, more than uh, more than that drag is incurred by the flow that uh, is is coming in into the vehicle from all these directions. So let's look at the longitudinal flow uh, as we have here. So the flow comes, and uh, depending on the speed of the car, the car is going very slow, relatively slowly, which is not typical of uh, of uh, uh, sports cars, but uh, if it's going slowly, you have this and you have the flow 
come back here. You have this, you have this. The faster the speed is going, the the greater the uh, the avoidance, the greater the tendency to avoid the flow the flow up here coming back into the vehicle because the the speed at which the vehicle is going is higher than the speed at which the, this could record. So that at a high speed, this is able to go go there by the time that this comes around and when it comes to this point as the vehicle is no longer there. But nonetheless, what happens is uh, it generates a force. All these all these forces, uh, these uh, flow from the side, they hit whoever is in here and uh, they generate uh, a force that uh, hits in this direction opposite to the direction of the flow and that acts to the drag of the flow. And the recoil of flow here going in this direction, uh, they, they all become aspects that add to the, to, the, uh, to the drag of the flow because this will hit elements in there, in, in, in the vehicle. So bottom line, a lot of drag is to be expected in sports cars. They are streamlined design, but uh, the, uh, the portions of the vehicle, the upper portions of the vehicle that are left to the elements uh, incur drag uh, to the extent that uh, it's typically more than uh, the, the drag that the aerodynamic design uh, has, has uh, avoided by, say, the absence of the top. So let's uh, look at um, this. This is a sunroof. Uh, the, there are typically uh, two types of, uh, of sunroof that uh, we, we, we have. There's the windows, uh, uh, the, the deflector and the, and the slider sunroof. So this is the deflector uh, uh, sunroof. Let's look at what happens in the case of the deflector sunroof. Uh, here's the deflector uh, up here. Many cars these days, they are designed so that you can use them, you can position them as deflector and as slider at the same time, depending on what you choose. But the deflectors are usually more noisy, much more noisy than the slider. Uh, that positioning the sunroof as deflector or uh, slider. The sunroof uh, is, is kind of like a design between the top left and uh, the sedan. So to some extent, one still enjoys the benefits of a sedan. And uh, perhaps some of the benefits of the topless uh, uh, of the topless car also, so it becomes kind of like a compromise design. So let's look at what happens in the case of the sunroof. The flow comes this way, it gets here, it's deflected in the off direction, and it, flow, it, it goes to the back. Uh, and uh, you don't have the disadvantage that will suffer here with all these uh, uh, flow coming into the vehicle. So we can expect for the same design, all other parameters being the same, we can expect less drag in a, in a sunroof car, whether it's deflector or slider, than we can uh, expect to have in a, in a topless car uh, of, uh, of the same uh, design for all other factors. Okay. This is a slider sunroof with, with the cutout there being the sunroof portion. This can be a little tricky. Uh, it's, it's not, what happens here, the aerodynamics that takes place here is not as simple as what takes place with uh, with uh, the uh, the, uh, the deflector sunroof, the slider sunroof. Or when the sunroof is in a sli slider position, it's a little more tricky. The flow comes here again, as it does. Some of the flow uh, go goes like that on the vehicle and follows, just like we will have for sedan. So we have that take place, and and that's straightforward enough. Now, but what happens is, what happens additionally is, when this is open, uh, some of the flow, because the flow goes on expecting a wall here, that which is the top, the top of the vehicle. That's, that's the wall that the flow is used to traveling upon. Now, there's nothing here. So it finds this. Some of it still goes straight. It continues its flow. But what would have attached to the wall to keep, keep a zero flow 
does not see anything there. So the flow drops in to the vehicle. And as it drops in, it does this. It does, does a number of really complicated things. It does uh, the following. Some of it goes, just drops into the, into the car, the passenger compartment. Some of it goes this way, keeps the speed at which it's going because it becomes deflected now and it goes in at some angle and it goes straight and hits the back of the car. That's uh, the, rear, uh, the rear windshield. Uh, uh, along the way, it hits occupants in there. They feel the air hitting them here. And some that comes uh, to hit the windshield itself, this is showing here in the diagram already. Uh, that portion which comes to hit the windshield itself is reflected, is deflected here, and it hits the passenger from the back, okay? Not even from the front. You have some of it that hits them from the front. Some come and hit the passenger from the back. Uh, and you have uh, some that goes back to the roof and is deflected to the front. So it can hit the driver from the back or some goes back and hits here. So you have a bunch of deflection uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, flows uh, that is, is happening. There's a deflector flow here and the, there's a reflector flow here. All these accumulate to occur inside the car. So as you can expect, there's a lot of turbulent flow in the car and you hear a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of noise due to this, uh, this kind of effect what would probably uh, need to be done if one wants the sunroof uh, on and, uh, and avoid so much noise is have the sunroof maybe a little bit uh, here, close to this portion. That's not all the way open because then uh, the, the, the speed, the rate at which the vehicle is going is such that this gap can be jumped uh, with, without discontinuity for all practical purposes. And, but what happens is you don't get as much air volume coming, as, as much exposure to air volume as would be desired. Uh, having said that though, uh, sometimes all a person really wants is the open sky, so uh, the glass can still cover it without the opening of the sunroof. And, and one would then enjoy the full benefit of a sedan, but would have uh, uh, the, the top open to the beautiful sky, which, which is, uh, which is uh, a beneficial thing, uh, depending on what uh, the occupants of the vehicle want. But these are the dynamics that take place uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, race cars and sports cars and uh, in the in the in the slider sunroof and in the deflector sunroof and various types that we have, um, we will stop here. We just want to give a, a little appetizer into into race cars and uh, convertibles and sport cars, and and I hope that this uh, uh, this gets you going and uh, generates your interest for that to look at the. Uh, the greater details that are available in the study of sports car, race cars, and aerodynamics.